So, welcome back, Tom, to our weekly podcast. Yeah. I've got Tom here from Winning Performance, and the article we're going to look at, you wrote um, back last year, midway through last year, about identifying and improving recovery. So, this is a nice follow-on, I think, to the sleep podcast we did last week. Yeah. I'm going to start probing you on... Why do we need to recover? Sounds a bit personal. Probably. Yeah, well, let's, let's start with a bit of probing. It's always a good place to start. Um, why do we need to recover? Surely I just need to train, train, train and keep going and be macho and hard. And uh, You'd think so, but for, in my eyes, it's, it, it's, it's never quantity at the expense of quality. So if you're not able to recover, I mean, we probably need to define recovering. But for me, in, 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 with the clients I utilise or I train, uh, mostly strength athletes is are you able to to come in the following week and and beat that number so recovering has been able to basically improve improve performance we've got it's sexy and cool nowadays to go hard as a motherfucker all the time h-a-m and people go in they train balls to the wall but they hit plateaus regularly as well and in fact, the name of the game with strength a lot of the time, or performance enhancement, as you know, is coaxing the body into into gains. So being able to recover, workout to workout or week to week is very important, especially when you look at the long term. It's very easy to make short term gains, um, but it's more difficult to plan and execute a plan over a longer period. And that becomes more and more challenging mm -hmm. every year you train. Because as your as your training age uh, gets older, the percentage increase you get becomes less. There's a chart somewhere I can't remember the percentages, but year one you can ex expect say let's put a number out of the year forty percent strength gains, for instance. Year two is then only twenty five, mm -hmm. fifteen. You get to somewhere year ten like me, and you're looking at a percent. Yeah, you're getting. I'm happy if I beat different when you've got weight categories, but if I'm in the same weight category, I'm happy. Look at Olympic weightlifters, they're happy if they put a kilo on their lift on a four year cycle. Five, five, ki five kilos on a, on a four year cycle, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's unbelievable. But recovery is important because you, you need to progress. Yeah. Simple. Um, one of the ways I've always looked at it is that training itself is just the, the process of breaking down and beating up your body. Mm and that recovery is the only time that you actually get the chance for those muscles to relearn and regrow yeah. and, and actually benefit from that. So. Yeah, I mean, if you look at Hans Selye's general adaptation syndrome, you look at the chart, you get the, the initial dip, uh, but you need to recover and supercompensate to, to actually for, for, for performance or progress to actually happen. Mm -hmm. And that's what people are not getting. or well, they're not getting it optimally. So instead of getting 2% gains, they're getting 1% gain, which again, over a longer time, it's slow. Okay. Now, I, I guess most people would sort of know when they're not recovering in the, how they're feeling, but do you have any more specific measures uh, that can help guide us? Yeah, I mean, the one in the article that comes up first is grip strength. And I use that a lot because oh, I'm always in the gym, and obviously my clients, my athletes are always in the gym. and. An easy one day to day is grip strength because it doesn't, it takes what, a couple of seconds to, to do? And you don't need sexy equipment. We have a dynamometer. Mm -hmm. You can standardize the test. So we can standardize things the same way you were standardizing your HRV. I'm, I'm sure we'll get to that uh, to that. But the grip's easy because most people will have a, a feedback on how difficult is it for me to hold a 20 kilo or a 15 kilo or 25 kilo plate just with their fingertips, just mm -hmm. pinch grip one hand or two hand doesn't matter um for me i'll grab a 25 and if i can pick that up and it feels extremely light and i feel like i could stand there all day i know that my nervous system has uh, has, has recovered because you've got peripheral fatigue and then central fatigue so this grip uh, test is more a measure measure of central fatigue so how much has your central nervous system recovered from training mm -hmm. whereas peripheral fatigue is more to do with uh, has your muscle like if I did a grip workout has my hand recovered from training it's like a local uh, fatigue due to training it locally and that's something that everybody can do easily with very little equipment first yeah. thing in the morning just pick up a weight and, yeah. and do that and I guess that's something you build up over time is yeah. that knowledge of 
how good was my grip yesterday and, and for so sure on. it's one of those things mm. that some clients or some some athletes will be able to go in and you get that and sometimes it can be it can be counterproductive but i will pick up the 42 kilo log the empty smallest small log we've got or small not smallest but smaller um and i'll know i know if i'm gonna have a good workout today mm -hmm. by how that feels you get people telling stories of how they'll bench the bar and if they don't feel good they'll walk out the gym it's not you know, they're not benching today because they know mm -hmm. they're not going to beat their performance last week but gripping a plate nice and easy because if a 25 slips out you know what yeah you shouldn't be maybe you should adapt the session yeah and this is where auto or the concept or the discussion of auto regulation can come into it and it's a case of if you're not going to go and into the gym and be stronger the argument is should you be training so maybe you shouldn't take do this exercise but you can cut you can cut out and you can adapt or you can you so you can go home or you can adapt the session uh, by modifying volume and or intensity mm -hmm. okay other things body weight body weight yes that would be <laughs> more to do with overtraining if your body weight goes down if your body weight goes down you're losing you're losing serious amounts of muscle mass that body weight uh, going down is not coming from fat loss but it will be you'll see body weight loss concurrent with uh, strength loss or difficult to difficulty obtaining strength gains uh, simply because less muscle mass less cross-section to fire so, you're so gonna, this will be weaker this would be a longer term metric rather than something you'd measure on yeah. a, a daily basis longer term so. or so I wrote just last week the overtraining protocol article mm -hmm. so it would happen in that but you want that to happen that, that, that that's the idea yeah. that's actually a good sign for that for that uh, uh protocol that the protocol's working or at least you're working hard enough for it to work we're looking obviously with our discussion today we're talking about just general fatigue yeah um but if, if your muscle mass isn't going up then and this would be used in conjunction with other things not in a uh, i'm always very wary of weight yeah. being an absolute metric but you would use it in conjunction with other Metrics. yeah I'd use it I'd, use, I'd probably mm. look at body weight uh, sorry body fat mm -hmm. so if I know the body fat circumference is or the diameter there uh, the total millimeters even uh, then I know concurrently what muscle mass might be doing because mm -hmm. if it's fat loss which you know with fatigue it really is yeah. just fat loss it, it'll usually be muscle uh, if it is fat loss then you've got that metric to, to be able to tell that blood pressure yeah blood pressure would be increased so again you can you can get the the machines that could that could measure it um you get some people that will be able to give you feedback within the exercise within mm -hmm. the session i see it a lot with front squats and overhead presses obviously with strongman overhead pressing is the sport is a main part of the sport and those two movements would uh, uh, highlight easily whether you've got an increase of blood pressure that comes about because of the stress hormones being up okay so cortisol adrenaline being too high so a lot of to, a lot of fatigue and recovery is to do with the adrenals and supporting the adrenals which is why when you look at the article there's lots of mentions of those stress hormones uh, what they do to the body yeah okay one of my favorites here is uh, hrv or heart rate yeah. variance yeah. you'd like to expand on that so hrv is heart rate variability the the, the foremost uh authors on the subject would be heart math funny story is i first heard about it from an irish guy and he was like heart mat heart mat and i was like what's a fucking heart mat i had to go and look it up anyway heart math um it's the it's the difference between or the variability between your heart beats as opposed to your your heart rate and, and, and how often it's beating so it's a difference between the two and the, the, there's there's measures in there to see if it's fluctuating more than it should and again, I know that you used it. I mean, you told me just before for 760 days con yeah. in a row consecutively yeah. Yeah. Um, to measure it. And was it off the back of James's advice or is this is something you already found? It was James got it. Yes, yeah. James is coaching. So James, James is like me, loves tracking things. And if you, mm. if you can find something as easy as that to track, yeah. we were discussing the difference between a heart rate monitor and a finger monitor. Finger monitor, you just put in, uh, put the finger in and it'll give you the, the feedback. And then it will tell you you know maybe whether it's time to train or time to adapt the training or time to take a rest day the, there was a couple of things for it for me was and firstly trying to understand what it what it actually meant and i describe it to people as if i've got a heart rate of 60 mm -hmm. the assumption is that your heart beats once every second mm. and the reality is it beats on an infrequent mm. 
um, basis and that 60 can be totally random during that during that minute yeah. but what HRV measures is what what that rate is mm. um, the more stressed you are the more or, or the closer to once every second your mm. heart will beat mm -hmm. because it's preparing you for activity right. if you are totally relaxed it goes off whenever it feels like it and that that's the way I tend to look at it in terms of the metrics you get uh, the the app I use, I actually use Elite HRV, mm -hmm. um, gives you, distills all the metrics down to a single number mm -hmm. between one and 10. Mm -hmm. And I found that a really useful common language between myself and James, who was coaching me, to be able to come in in the morning and say, I'm a 10 today, mm -hmm. I'm ready to train, mm -hmm. or I'm a two. This is the metric that backs up that mm -hmm. I, I should be taking recovery. So yeah. the common language, I think, is very helpful. Yeah, yeah, that. That makes you, right. definitely makes it short, efficient, doesn't it? Um, looking more at things like testosterone and cortisol levels. So as we said, the stress hormones are a big indicator. So the higher your stress hormones, the worse your T to C, or testosterone to cortisol ratio, uh, would be, and stress hormones can actually steal uh, from your from your testosterone, so you might get pregnenolone still, so that you'll get more conversion uh, into cortisol as opposed to DHEA, DHEA sulfate. I believe that's the the, the option. So pregnenolone can go to one of the two. Mm -hmm. So for you to be in optimal shape, or if you're my athlete and I want to peak you, I want to maximise testosterone levels, and I want to. I want to, it's not it's not necessarily minimize, but let's look at it in a, in a simple way. I want to minimize excess cortisol output, we'll call it. Um, obviously cortisol is good during training, There's, it needs to be high then. But the general ratio, if you did saliva tests and testosterone tests, you want one to be high and one to be mm -hmm. you know, high in the morning and then other times it's, it's managed. Whereas you know, today people get huge fluctuations in their cortisol, They're stressed on and off all the time where it should be only stressed inverted commas during your workout so you're ready to, ready for fight or flight then um <laughs> the most cost effective mechanism for this is sex drive so men should be waking up with a hard-on that would literally i'll tell you what i've done a testosterone uh protocol before mm -hmm. and as i went through the it was charles's old one as i went through the 32-day protocol as i got towards the end i literally was woken up by my erection because it caught it was it was so like painful painfully hard in the morning i literally woke up because of it i was like what the fuck's going on um it takes you back to when you're um uh like adolescent kid and you're getting random hard-ons in class similar thing i wasn't having it on the gym before thankfully <laughs> anyway there's a good story for everyone to hear that, about. that's an excellent test yeah. <laughs> but in obviously the the most obvious time when men should be having an erection besides randomly in class um would be first thing in the morning so you should be waking up at whatever and testosterone levels are supposed to peak in the morning and then yes fell off during the day so that would yeah yes i'm just trying to imagine the chart we might use to <laughs> <laughs> so there's there's that there um and then women obviously don't have erections, but you'd be able to tell from sex drive. Mm -hmm. So it, you can ask personal questions like that. It's just a case of yeah. client being comfortable with answering it. And and so that sort of recovery by using a number of these different metrics mm -hmm. and pulling them together as yeah. well as gut feel, because I imagine people know yeah. when, they're, when they're tired. We talked yeah. about the sleep last week. Yeah. Um, but with a combination of those five things, yeah. we can get a pretty good idea of how people are recovering. G going back to that testosterone, I do remember Charles saying that the most important time to train is when you're horniest, in, in a nutshell, because that's when your testosterone is going to be going to mm -hmm. be highest. And again, that, that's obviously why you get two different types of clients. You get people that train in the morning, people train in the evening. You get people that have a higher sex drive in the morning, people have a higher sex drive in the evening. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So. I know how important recovery is. I know how to measure that I'm not recovering. How can I enhance that recovery with the with the time I have? Yeah, so number one, base of the pyramid, is what we discussed on the last podcast, which is sleep. Uh, th there's no outrunning that. Mm -hmm. There's no magic pill that's gonna be like, right, take this and your recovery is gonna be excellent. So we recommend that you go back 
either listen to the podcast or read the article and make sure sleep is 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 done. Um, there are a variety of other things you could you could look at. So you could add in extra modalities. Now, the biggest drawback with the extra modalities, which we can go through individually, is extra investment in time. People are very time sensitive these days. Mm -hmm. I, f I find this more and more the the amount of the amount of clients we get into the gym because we've got we've got a, what we would call a recovery room. We, it's referred to as a biohacking room. It's all the same shit. So in there we have an infrared sauna. We have a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. We have red light therapy, which is also known as photobiomodulation. And then we have frequency specific microcurrents. So you can use all these items in this recovery room. But the only drawback to these is you have to invest extra time. Mm -hmm. And people are very time sensitive. So that's the only drawback to using them. Um, so do you want to touch on each one individually? I think so if we yeah. look at Let's look at the biggest bang for your buck. I, my my opinion is the the hyperbaric oxygen chamber mm -hmm. has a huge return on investment. Now there's there's different areas where so, that, that say oh it's effective for this and effective for that. The way I see it is you're getting a super maximal oxygen uptake into your body. Your tissues recover faster. In fact, that's what all of these do. Red light, same thing. Red light or photobiomodulation, uh, infrared, near and far infrared light penetrate skin. They can get all the way to uh, organs slash bones uh, and penetrate there. And they excite the cells and re-energize the cells so that maybe the cellular turnovers mm -hmm. uh, quicker. Um, and it's the same thing with, with all the other items. They, they make your body work, uh, work better after using them. But the hyperbaric oxygen chamber, for me, immediately post-workout is the window you want to use it. I've looked at it other times. I do not see any point of it on a day off. I think the main reason being is... It helps exert a parasympathetic dominance. So if we've got para and sympathetic, para being, you know, if you think of a parachute, it's winding you down, mm -hmm. it's slowing down your nervous system, it's putting you into rest and digest. Uh, again, I always refer back to him, but Charles always said, focus on reducing cortisol output as quickly as you can post-workout. Now he had a lot of different uh, supplement protocols and we, we can touch on them. But if you can use something like the high pack oxygen chamber you get the, the benefit of the super maximal oxygen helping all the tissues in your body but you're also getting your nervous system to calm down another way to calm the nervous system down is to lie down and mm -hmm. as you know our hbot our high pack chamber is, you have to lie down in it what can you do when you're lying down in there well you might want to look at your phone for a little bit but after a while your arms get tired so you stop that pretty quickly if you've got nothing else to do mm -hmm. but sleep yeah um and naps being the next best thing recovery that when i when i'm peaking i will go in and that will be my my four weeks out not before four weeks out i'll get in the chamber after every workout mm -hmm. or at least my neural workout so i can i can recover quicker and i even put the microcurrent on the microcurrent is good because again uh, it can help regenerate tissues quicker it can help resynthesize the atp quicker and for me specifically there's a doms protocol but also another parasympathetic protocol you could use uh, post workout. So I'm going to come back to the microcurrent. So people who are listening and who haven't seen a uh, oxygen chamber, yeah, having been in this particular one, it's a sort of sausage that you unzip in the top. <laughs> you you climb in, you lie down, and it is very soothing. Mm -hmm. You know, like you say, just the act, even if there wasn't any oxygen in there, you, you might tell me later that actually it's just ordinary air. Funny you should say that because one of the coaches <laughs> recently got in and didn't do one of the zips up. Okay. So he was sat there and he went to sleep. And then my other coach, Will, came up and he was like, uh, what's going on? Because it sounded different, but he didn't come up for 45 minutes. So I think he had about 15 minutes, maybe, maybe 10 minutes of, decom of, of compressed oxygen. Right. But it, as you say, like somatic, somatic response is a thing. Yeah. If you think you're doing something extra and you think you feel on top of the world, that's, that's part of the process, in my opinion. Just that sort of forced relaxation is, uh, and it's, it's not a claustrophobic space. I think it's been quite well designed in that there's sufficient space around you that you don't feel too. Not claustrophobic for you. I bought that because of the amount of, <laughs> because of the, the strong men that we've had in there. You know, people that are 150 kilos, yeah, six okay. foot five. All right, so there's somebody at 75 kilos, it's yeah. not. Uh, you could roll over and do backflips, but yeah. these guys can lie down and that's about it. <laughs> Uh, taking back to the the microcurrent, then is is that like a tens machine? Or? No, it's different. Tens machine. So the the mm. be, the way I was explained uh, with regard to frequency specific microcurrent is tens machine works in a thousandth of an amp. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Okay. And a microcurrent or frequency specific is microcurrent is a millionth of an amp. And then your body works in a trillionth of an amp. Now look how far away the, the thousandth is to the trillionth. Mm -hmm. Millionth is much closer. So it matches your body's frequency much closer. TENS machine, there are various protocols. You can you can find them. I'll tell you where to find it. Go to to Charlie Francis talks about it. Do you remember Charlie Francis? Sprint I coach? Do. Yeah. He talks about it on T Nation and different protocols that, that they would use. And I think there's some, there's various Russian methodology that uses it. So there is a use to it. I'm not saying it's useless, mm -hmm. but the main thing with TENS is it masks pain. Yeah. If you want it, and that's why they use it for pregnancy, yeah. uh, uh, during birth. Um, so yeah, masking pain can be good in some situations, but microcurrent is like putting cash in the bank. It is putting the actual electrons into your body that you need that resonate with that tissue. So let's say you've got bum knee, so we use joint ligament tendon bursa protocol. It's putting those uh, electrons into that, that specific area and restoring uh, the injury, so to speak. So like putting cash in the bank is putting the actual electrons into your body, which is why you feel a little bit stiff afterwards. And then the next day, all of a sudden you feel much okay. better. Um, so it's nothing like a TENS unit, in my opinion, it's completely different. Okay, cool. Red light. Yeah, red light's good, red light's good. Um, it's weird because I actually use, I, I recommend it more pre-workout now. Um, so we've got a Juve J double O V V full body, but you can use it pre or post because it's. I think you could probably describe it as adaptogenic, meaning if you need it to energize you and wake you up, it can. If you for, for the workout, but if you need it to restore uh, an injury, it can also do that. Mm -hmm. Um, exact mechanism of how it works it's near and far infrared light and it will energize at a cellular level so things start repairing themselves things start going on uh, at a cellular level mm -hmm. I know uh, having spoken to James about it he he swears by it and uh, yeah. uses them very very frequently yeah so. I think it's brilliant I think mm -hmm. even if I think there's a, there's a stat on the Juve website and you can find the study and it equates it to how many it's like 10 minutes looking into it for your, for your eyes is the equivalent of a full day in the sun for for what you get from it mm -hmm. okay um nutrition nutrition oh that's a, <laughs> it's a broad subject so nutrition specifically i don't want to get too much into like because everyone's th there has to be context and uh, as long as you're getting adequate or we'll call calories we'll just talk about calories adequate calories mm -hmm. then then that's a good thing the, the biggest thing I see with recovery isn't necessarily just the basic nutrition I see the ones who recover better they, they also make sure that they're um they've got the main micronutrients going into the body uh, the basics being magnesium vitamin D if you if you're deficient in these magnesium you will be Vitamin D, depending on the person, zinc, usually you are. Those three at the top of the list. Okay. Uh, so micronutrients are more important. But, I mean, I went through a period of, of training on little to no food, because I was trying to stay at under 90, uh, or at least 95 all year round, and that affected my performance uh, quite drastically. Mm -hmm. So carbohydrates obviously being an, impo in, an important fuel source. Um, reloading glycogen post-workout is another thing I think we mentioned in the article. Uh, which will help recovery yeah because again it has an impact on growth hormone uh, and cortisol output and what would i take for glycogen what, what's glycogen that? replenishment simple sugars yeah. so just a, a, a maltodextrin there's loads of different carb powders now mm -hmm. uh, you can get multi carb powders where they have different release curves so you get an instant release a little bit later release a little bit later so you're getting a constant supply of sugars post-workout with a protein yeah. shake um so that's the main thing really cool without going into too much depth um you also mentioned needling dry needling dry needling is good yeah or even if you so dry needling is slightly different to acupuncture and that being that acupuncture follows meridians traditional traditional chinese medicine um and again there's lots of debate on whether there's science but again it's difficult to uh it's difficult to quantify in a, certain, in a scientific setting what it's doing, but there's more and more studies in acupuncture now. Anyway, dry needling can help blood flow to local areas. Mm -hmm. It can also put you into a, a parasympathetic state very quickly, depending on where you're putting them. Um, 
Peter Lundgren's brilliant with that. He, he, he speaks all about that. Um, but it's like, you could think of the blood flow similar to cupping, mm -hmm. but cupping causes horrific bruising and can be uncomfortable for people. But then again, some people are afraid of needles, so cupping would, yeah. be, cupping would be preferential. Um, I've, I've always seen needles almost as a sort of um, very, very localised form of trigger pointing technique in massage, yeah. where you can only get as small as your thumbs when you're, when yeah. you're massaging, but you can actually go in with a needle and, yeah. and just tell an area of the body that it's tight mm. or that there's a problem there and get the body's natural responses yeah. to, to start going. Uh, That's all this is. We're trying to kickstart the body's natural uh, yeah. healing effect, whether it's the microcurrent or the chamber or the needling. That's all we're trying to do. Yeah. Excellent. Any other recovery tips? Recovery tips. Uh, I like the sauna. You look at the Russians, Klokov swears by it. The mm -hmm. Klokov, um, swears by it post-workout. So you can get I think it's the studies say an average of thousand percent either way you get a huge pulse of growth hormone post workout which again has huge uh, effect on recovery just look at what bodybuilders do there's clues there mm -hmm. so bodybuilders use insulin and get some big so if you can try and harness the power of insulin aka figure out when you want the most sugars and how many sugars you need you'll put on muscle mass and recover equally bodybuilders take growth hormone and again, we're looking at sports that are uh, untested, yeah? It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not legal or anything. Um, and it helps their recovery, helps their joints, helps their soft tissue, helps them recover quicker. So, if you're sport, so you're, you're, a, you're a track and field athlete, you cannot take any of these exogenous, exogenous hormones because you'd be disqualified. Mm -hmm. Whether other people do or not, you know, it's up to them. So you can't take them, therefore, how do we improve growth hormone output? Uh, besides sleep, sauna is one. Okay. And I've, I've definitely, I've definitely seen a, a huge benefit. Um, as we said recently, sweating this time of year, it's cold, especially where we live in England. Yeah. So getting in the sauna and, and helping your body's natural processes, and having a good sweat on, and getting rid of toxins that way out of your skin. Yes. Uh, if you if it reduces your toxic load enough to to really help recover it, then know, but it, it helps the feeling. Um, a lot of clients uh, will have a sauna and they will feel more relaxed. So again, we've got that parasympathetic nervous system dominance mm -hmm. uh, that can help people. Okay, cool. All right, so really just wrapping up now, we've, we've looked at how vital recovery is, how to recognize it, a number of really cool metrics and, yep. and feel good things. I suppose one thing I didn't mention if we go, if we go like how can we improve recovery from a supplement point of view? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I did mention that in the article, but again, if we look at the promoting parasympathetic dominance uh, and helping that, there's a number of adaptogenic herbs that you could consider that support the adrenals. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of ways that I've presented or I've, I've you know, that I've got from other people, uh, functional medicine practitioners, strength coaches. So one is to take adrenal glandulars one month. So let's say, what are we in? We're in February. So this month is, you take adrenal glandulars, bovine or porcine, so beef or pork, whatever. Um, you take them month one. Month two, use adaptogens. The issue with that adaptogens is you're meant to rotate them because you can become a little bit, they can lose their lose their kick. Mm -hmm. I think it's adapt. So herbs, you need to rotate, whereas uh, pharmaceuticals you can keep for a longer period, which is the way the body reacts to them. So you would take adaptogen formula one, one week, and another one next week, another one next week to support your adrenals. And therefore, I think Christian Thibodeau talks best about it. So if you find his video on, on overtraining and the adrenal response, he talks about it's all to do with the adrenal response. Mm -hmm. So my take home is support the adrenals. So vitamin C is another big one uh, that I would have as a constant, but there's, there's several adaptogen formulas that you could consider okay. that will help restore your adrenals which then gives you a bigger or a better output uh, for training super anything you want to add in in wrapping up i, th I think we've we've covered some great things here Lo lots of ways of enhancing recovery lots of ways of measuring it i think we understand how important it is anything else you'd like to finish with no i mean we've included a bonus story so i mean what, yeah, more, of course. What, what more could you want? There is nowhere left, left to go. <laughs> <laughs> we'll call that a wrap, I think. Okay. Thanks very much, Tom. Until the next time.